I have to do everything above and beyond to convince them that I am worth their time. I am worthy vet. I promise just because I'm not middle-aged white man does not mean that I am not worthy vet. Um, and I just feel like it's constantly, it's just extra pressure, extra strain and extra work just right. to convince people that a surface level appearance doesn't impact your ability to be a vet, which is Hey everyone, and welcome back to the It's Good to Talk podcast. We have got Dr. Izzy, and I'm not even going to try and say the rest of it. Some of you will be like, wait a minute, I kind of have seen this before, maybe. Yes, we did try this, and there's a few of you that may have seen this. We got to a few hundred people before. Um, we just kind of went, actually, that's not quite right. There's a few things on there. And for any of you that have been around uh, with the channel since we started, I've always said, if there's something that's not right or that people don't want it in there, I'm not cutting it out. I'm not doing any of that editing shit. I am just deleting the fucking video. So the video is gone. You can't find it now. We are back with this. So we're going to try again. This is take two. Um, and uh, hopefully there's more of you that see this. So <laughs> how are we doing today, Izzy? I'm doing good, thank you. Uh, round two, as obviously you just said. So hopefully this one is a little bit more A, concise and B, just more... More to my tastes, if you see what I mean. So yeah, for a start, my eyeliner is better today. So you know, reason <laughs> enough. <laughs> I, there, there's got to be a few people out there that the second you said concise and like they just saw me and just went, "There's fucking no chance." <laughs> we can, but try. You know what? Optimism is a big indeed, thing. <laughs> indeed, and I mean, you've got you've got work tonight, right? I do. So you've got me for the best part of an hour. There you go. And and the the point is is that you're here because you're a vet and you're literally leaving the podcast to go do Betty stuff. Literally so... <laughs> in my scrubs. I'm in my scrubs as we speak. <laughs> That's awesome. I love <laughs> just the random colours. So um, for those of you that um, don't know, you may be looking and going, wait a minute, I know from something completely different. She's a vet, the fuck? Yes, Izzy is a vet. If you read on TikTok, it says dog to Izzy. That's not just a play on words. Uh, Izzy is, in fact, a um, a veterinary surgeon. So we're here basically to talk about um, vets and mental health. And if we have time, a little bit of everything else and putting the world to rights, but we'll see. Um, well, there we but, go. Yes. But obviously, um, vets are one of the highest um, proportion of uh, careers that unfortunately complete suicide. They are number four on the, the list worldwide, um, along with uh, dentists and uh, doctors. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, why? Can and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make it as string. broad as possible. Um, and, you know, also do tell us everything else as to how, kind of how you got there and why you want to speak up as well. Um, because when I, for many of you that, that don't know, I basically, for podcasts, shoot my fucking shot everywhere. So I just randomly sent Izzy a message and the immediate response was, hell yes, I want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, please do tell us kind of how you got into it, why it's you're so passionate about it and, and what you think mm -hmm. the hell is going on. So, I mean, my sort of brief, backstory for veterinary was I wanted to be a vet since I was very young I think I was about eight years old when I first started muttering to my parents about wanting to be a vet I think they at the, at the time probably thought yeah that's what all kids say <laughs> but this 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 hankering never stopped it only got more and more mm. and then pretty much throughout my entire teenage years all I was doing when I was at school was thinking I can do this for vet school I can do this for vet school this will be UCAS points this will work towards my application da 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 the whole thing it was obsessive and then I got to vet school when I was 18. I got in first time of asking, which is pretty good, to be honest. Some people take lots of times. One of my best friends, um, who was a nurse I used to work with, uh, still, still one of my absolute besties, um, she has applied four times to get into vet school, and she's only just now got in. Pure wow. dogged persistence has got her in. <laughs> Literally, I'm like, that's, that's incredible. Dogged persistence as well. Sorry, I know that was... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> But yeah, she has finally got in. So some people take two or three attempts to get in. I was lucky on the first. Um, I went to the Royal Veterinary College. I studied there for five years. That is a five-year course. I don't know where people get seven years from. It's always been five. Um, but yeah, so we studied there. Very long, very hard, very draining course. Damaging in its own right, mental health-wise, but not that bad. Um, and then I've now been a practicing vet for over four years. I 
went into day practice initially with small animals only. I've never done farm work or equine work as a practicing vet. I've only ever done small animals or companion animals. Um, and I went into the practice in 2018 in August and I carried on doing days until December of 2020. And then in the middle of that month, so the very end of 2020, I started doing emergency work out of hours. So I do night work uh, and I also do bank holidays and things like that. So for example, this this year, in a couple of weeks time, I will be working over the Christmas period. So I'm doing the nights on the 23rd of December to the 27th. So I'm doing the uh, pretty much the, the, the nasty shift <laughs> for yeah. Christmas. But I do get New Year off. I did specifically request I prefer to have New Year off this year because I was working New Year last year. That's just the life of out of hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my my backstory into the veterinary world. But there's so many issues with the vet world that that causes terrible mental health. And I'll kind of I'll do a brief brief list, as it were, and then if you pick out some points you want to talk about from there. If there's things that are surprising or if there are things that you think, why the hell is that there? Or, you know, this is really interesting. Should we dive into it a bit more? Um, so we've got burnout, big burnout. Um, the average retention rate in the veterinary world is about 4.8 years from graduation to quitting, which is not good at all, considering that is less time than the course takes to yeah. graduate. Um, there is a extreme lack of staff. So nurses, PCAs, and vets themselves, there is a big lack of which there are reasons for that as well, which we can get into in a bit. Um, a very big lack of understanding from the from the general public about what it is we do, what it is we go through, why our prices are structured the way we are, why our companies are structured the way we are, why we work the hours we do, why we do the things that we do, yada, yada. Um, a lack of general support in terms of both from management like within a practice and then the profession in general can sometimes be a very lonely place even though we're very aware of suicide rates being as high as they are and mental health being as terrible as it is mm. there's still a lack of support sometimes and a lack of places to feel you can reach out to they're like there's a there's a helpline but you don't always want to call a helpline and talk to a stranger and you don't always have friends who understand like very few of my friends who aren't vets understand what the problems are with being a vet the only people who know are a, a handful of people, maybe not even that, maybe two people in my life who aren't vets, who understand how bad it is and understand all the issues. And that's only because they've seen me going for as long as they have and they've let me tell them about it. Everyone else, they kind of see this job as a bit of a novelty. You know, the classic, they play with puppies and kittens all day, <laughs> which I think a lot of people still have in their head. And I'm like, my guy, no. <laughs> For a start, most of the animals hate our guts because we're doing things to them that they don't like. Pretty much most animals don't want to be there. Mm. So they're not having a good time. They don't play with anything. Yes, I see puppies on the occasion when I do vaccines. But actually, as an out of hours vet, I very rarely see puppies. And when I do see them, they're really unwell. So it's not a fun experience. I'd rather not see puppies, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, but you don't, I think that's maybe what, like 3% of the job is seeing puppy consults or something like that. And then you think about it as, while that vet is there doing a puppy consult, there's every chance that maybe five minutes before they were probably euthanizing someone's you know, beloved family pet in the previous consult. They've had to take that sympathetic mask off, put it in the special store jar, get their happy puppy kitten face, slap that on in the space of a few minutes and then call in the next client because they're probably behind and they're probably delayed in their consults and they need to make sure they don't get later or the clients get irate, which segues me into another big problem. Client expectations mm. in the last few years the expectations have gone like this and the actual capabilities of what we can do have done this clients expectations are so unrealistic and so high it's not helped by veterinary media showing the creme de la creme of veterinary abilities and skills and things like that which i i it's it's not anyone's fault per se but it's the way that the public perceives us it makes some people seem like we're we're incredible we can do anything when i'm like no we are we're medics so that well, one what? eye bloke's fault no <sighs> <laughs> the super vet has a lot to ask and answer for but unfortunately <laughs> given my professional state <laughs> i i unfortunately cannot comment too hard on it but i will say this very clearly you don't ever hear prices discussed on the super vet mm. and we are talking five figured bills regularly especially for the things you see like that on the show with 10,000 easy easy 
and some, and some. Literally, it's mental. Some of that stuff so does remind me of um, American Dad. I don't know if you've ever seen this episode where they have a dog that's uh, like squashed and Stan working for the CIA just turns into some kind of fucking cyborg that is barely <laughs> alive because it's been, you know, it's and, and you're just like, just, you know, at this point, it, it just needs, like, actually. It just, needs to let, it just needs to be let go. Yeah. That is an issue we also face is owners who are not ready to let go of their animals, even though their animals are about three and a half paws in the grave already. And you're like, you need to let these animals go because this is against their welfare. Like we literally, one of my friends, she messaged me just today, a case that she's, she's of telecoms. So she does consults over the phone and then triages them and then either sends them for a consult or she remote describes medication. It's quite a common job. It, since the pandemic, it's got more common. And it's very useful actually, because it gets a lot of things done. It sort of filters out the busy clinics, the, cons- the actual needed consults. Um, but she said, this dog is, ancient very old and it's got horrible osteoarthritis so just arthritic joint degeneration and it's been on a million different pain meds obviously not a million but you know what i mean it's been on a lot of pain relief none of it's working this dog cannot stand it doesn't want to eat or drink anymore it's constantly whining but the owners won't put it to sleep because they want it to live past christmas the dog doesn't know it's christmas the dog has no idea what christmas is all they know is that they are in incurable agony. Let them go. But people, this is this is not uncommon. People will try and push their animals on to make them pass this arbitrary calendarial life, uh, like milestone. So past my partner's birthday, past New Year, past Christmas, past Easter, past the kids leaving home or something like that. Or, oh, I know they're in a lot of pain now, but my kid's away. Can we leave it 24 hours so they can come home and be with them? And I'm like, I got no choice there, have I? Because you can't put them down if they if they are not willing to do it in that moment. Mm. And all I end up having to do is just absolutely load these animals up with pain relief and send them home for twenty four hours while they say their goodbyes with their families. And I'm like, look, if it needs doing, it needs doing now. Quite honestly, you can't. It's crueler to make the animals wait. And at the end of the day, do you really want their the last time you see them to be just before they're about to be euthanized, or would you rather the last time you see them be them in peak condition? I lost my rabbit when I was at uni. Um, he had heart he had heart failure, um, and I wasn't there when he died. My mum was, but my last recent memories of him were me giving him a cuddle and putting him in his touch, and he was at full health. I preferred that personally, but yeah. that's just me. That's purely an opinion thing. But either way, clients not wanting to let animals go is a very hard pill to swallow. Very hard pill to swallow because you're like, I have the one thing that can put you out of pain forever, and you won't let me do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's. <sighs> I, I mean, it, I get, I get the, the the kind of perspective from some people because obviously the animal can mean a lot more. Like, say that they're that that person's homeless and the dog they have mm-hmm. is literally the only family or life they've had for the past god knows how long. Then they aren't rationally thinking of it in the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but it, the rational thinking is probably the key word there because yeah. even if they are, you know, the one thing they have left or they're the one thing that they have in their life. If you care about them that much, you owe it to them to treat them properly and to do the right thing by them, which sometimes, unfortunately, is letting them go. Yeah. And if you go against medical advice of euthanasia for yourself, you're not doing it for the dog. You're doing it for yourself. And that's it's not right. So. Yeah, especially with the idea of like, let's make it to Christmas or make it part of the like it's it's a it, it's cal- it's calendarial crap. It really is. Because you're doing it for the, the dog doesn't know. <laughs> Yeah, you're not. You're not doing. It's not like um, you know, if if the do- if there was some way we could tell that the dog really knew exactly or whatever animal knew exactly everything and really wanted to make it to, you could at least make an argument of well, it's for their, it's for the animal because the animal literally wants to make it to them. But the animal, yeah, like, yeah. I'm in fucking pain. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> what the hell? I think probably one of the biggest things I hear from owners from who have had animals that they've put down, one of the most common feedbacks that they say is. I wish we'd done it sooner. Mm. And that's it. That is a strong, echoing, uh, repeating sentiment that I hear quite a lot from owners, from pe- from dogs who have long term conditions. Usually, it's things like arthritis or cancers. Probably the two top reasons we would euthanize an animal is arthritis, ongoing, and cancer. If you can't control pain and you can't control the spread of a disease, that's as good a reason as any to let an animal go because you can't fix it basically, and them having it is suffering. So, you know. Yeah, it, it's 
they, they, they very often say, I wish I'd, we'd done it sooner without waiting for him to not be able to eat or not be able to stand or anything like that. Because to, for an animal to get to the point where they cannot do something as basic as eat or drink or stand up or the point that they're defecating and weeing in their own bed because they just cannot physically stand, they don't have the strength. It's no dignity to them. It's no way to spend your last few days. It sometimes is better to call it quits when you know it's something terminal. You, like period, you know it's something terminal. It's sometimes better to be like, okay, they're not too bad. Let them go now before they get too bad. You know, there, there's a lot to be said for that, but I think that is asking quite a lot of people. Um, but I just wish more people would listen to us with those ones. Euthanasias are not the hardest part of my job. A lot of people say this. They're like, I could never do your job. I could never put an animal down. I'm like, yeah, you could. Honestly, you would rather this animal be not alive than be suffering. That is by far the preferable choice in a lot of these it's harder seeing them carry on and being forced on in agony that's harder to be honest i think the hardest parts of my job are either clients being abusive outright abusive or the specific scenario of someone brings in a cat that's been hit by a car is dead has a microchip you then have to call the owner and say hi we have your cat i'm afraid they're dead not as deadpan as that obviously but you know you have to talk to them on the phone and you just you know on the phone when it's ringing you're about to ruin someone's day life you're about to ruin their ruin their week ruin their month whatever and you're like cool this is fun those are the bits of the job that really flipping suck they really suck yeah and i mean do you have it where because I, I know a big thing for for some doctors and especially nurses is fear of people to be honest my size having a go at you because if you're like i'm making assumptions of your height here but if someone my size at six foot two is shouting at you again in your face or you know whatever I, I, that can be very intimidating no matter who the hell you are like it it doesn't it doesn't matter you know anything of like if you've got someone of of, of a of a size over six foot that's broad having a go at you it's very intimidating and there's there's a lot of um, things with that. Does mm. that become an issue for you as well? Because that's not something that, I mean, you get it in, you can get it in retail and restaurants, but it's not that often. Most of the time it's someone shouting, the manager comes out and that's the end of it. But you've said yourself that there's a lack of, you know, kind of um, supervisory oversight and issues like that. So does that become more of an issue? And is there anything that's done with it? Because I know some of the uh, breakaway training that's done for the nhs and let me just talk to the nhs right here it's shite do not teach people to do that unless you want your doctors and nurses harmed and anyone that wants to come at me i'm an internationally recognized self-defense instructor and i've been training in martial arts for over 30 years fucking come at me anyway um <laughs> i fucking hate breakaway training it really pisses me off but like um yeah so is, is that something that, that's an issue for you as well uh well you'd be right to assume on my height i i some people say I give off tall people energy. I don't know what about me screams tall people energy. I have no idea. My hands are minuscule. I wear a size eye ring and I am five foot four. I am a tiny person all round. Oh, on um, camera, apparently I look five seven, I got told once. I'm like, what the fuck? That's a very specific <laughs> number. <laughs> Whatever. But yeah, I'm, 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 I am quite small and I am not slightly built. I wouldn't say I'm like, you know, like a, like a racing snake or anything like that. But I'm not, I'm not big, to be honest. I'm just a very, very average shape the very average height um but yeah I, I have had some clients before get very irate and when you're on nights there's usually only two of you so a nurse and a vet that's it that can get scary but i would say in all honesty that's not that common right. I, I don't i don't see it that often you, you verbal abuse yeah whatever that that does happen unfortunately and people getting angry or people complaining or people just getting annoyed over bills and things like that that happens that's frustrating and it can be very personally hurtful but in terms of people getting physically aggressive i've only had one person in my career while i've been doing nights that i've been that close to calling the police on um excuse me some of the veterinary centers that have it as a more common occurrence so i would say unfortunately inner city centers tend to have it worse i don't work in an inner city practice i work in a town practice um but there are some inner city ones where it is more of a problem uh they have panic buttons like uh like loud alarm buttons that also direct the hotlines to the police um you know as a standard panic button would do you know 
And usually those busy clinics don't tend to have just one vet, one nurse on at night. They tend to have a couple vets or a couple nurses. So at least they've got backup in the clinic. Um, I know some practices that are quite big, like space wise, they have air horns around. So if there's an emergency, an air horn will sound so that wherever the other people are, they will come to where the air horn is. So that can be fire, a crashing animal, a problem with the stuff like a, like a, like a client or something like that. It's a good idea, really, because the air horn's never going to run out of battery, let's be real. <laughs> so, yeah. I actually like that as a, as, a, as a weird way of putting the person off as well. Just fucking air horn. Yeah, literally. That, that, <laughs> to be honest, the panic alarm itself being loud and obnoxious is enough to put halt pe- most people in their tracks. And the air horn as well is weird enough to probably put people off. So, yeah, it's not a bad, uh, like, sort of, like a sort of instant minor disarming method as well, which gives you enough time to think and react to mm. get around them. But yeah, we've never been instructed. You, you'll be glad to hear. We're never taught breakaway. We're never taught self-defense or anything like that. We're not, we're basically taught if in doubt, call the damn police. Like literally that's all we're told. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I I know some self-defense from when I was at school, but I wouldn't put it into practical application unless I was utterly, utterly desperate. Yeah. Um, which, to be honest, I, I would much rather go into my consult room and lock the damn door. Probably That's usually lock. what I try and do. That's usually what I would do is if I'm like, OK, this person is getting dangerous. I'll go into the nearest lockable room and lock the door. That's pretty much what I would do. And then call the police. So I always have my phone on me. So Absolutely. And and given that you learned the self-defense at school, I've seen some of those and you're probably far better going into your room and locking the door. Um, it's I'm, not great I'm self-defense. A, and I'm a cynical fucker, but I've seen some of this stuff um and uh yeah some of the breakaway training if you're you know five foot four and you do it against me grabbing you one you need me to be completely <laughs> like stand still for you to do it and secondly no. i'm not gonna let go that easily you know fuck. anyway that's a that's a different conversation if anyone wants to see that go to um <laughs> kick to the crotch podcast on youtube that's my kick other podcast crotch, on, no. on um, self-defense and martial arts and you'll see me talking with other martial artists and Dorman and people like that talking about how bullshit that is. Didn't mean to plug my other podcast in here, but fuck it, it came up anyway. Might um, as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously you don't have that, but you do have you send a lot of the verbal stuff and you lot of this kind of I say Karen phenomena, but I, it's always been around. It's all, I guess that's the right uh, word for it. <laughs> yeah, and it's so I suppose. I started seeing a, a lot more in in general around this idea that the customer is always right. Is that basically what you kind of see? Because um, I'm going to put this one out there: the customer's never fucking right, and um, that's why you're the customer and not the staff. Um, so, <laughs> is that the kind of thing you, you're you're constantly come up against? Because, like I said earlier, you can't say it. I will. The super vet did something that probably shouldn't have done for millions of fucking pounds, and they're just going, "Well, he did it." Why can't you? And, it, you know, I know it's possible. I saw it on there as if it's a fucking YouTube tutorial. Like, is that the kind of stuff you're coming up against? Um, There is a very, very steep increase in client expectation recently. Mm. It's been, it, it started, it was already getting bad before the pandemic, but the pandemic made it go whoop because pet ownership during the pandemic shot up, absolutely shot up. It was called the puppy boom because people were having so many puppies and breeders were making so much money and everyone and their mother was getting a dog to the point where I would see people's posts on Facebook saying new family member and another dog. And I'd be like, I, normally I'd be like, oh, that's new puppy. I was going, oh, God, not another one. <laughs> and that's bad. That was bad when you're having to think that. But yeah, I mean, Karenism, we can call it that, I suppose. It's entitled clients who are not reasonable, expecting absolute a star perfect flawless service without a single issue without realizing that a veterinary medicine is not a flawless subject anyway it's a medical thing no medical procedures in this world are ever flawless because it's medical for a start there's always complications there's delays sometimes sometimes things aren't predictable you know anesthetics may take longer than expected you can get post-operative complications Sometimes animals might even crash, you know, when you don't expect it to. It's all on consent forms, but clients read it through and it just goes in one ear, out the other. And you're like, you signed this form, I explained this form to you, whatever. But, you know, expecting things like calling up on the day and demanding a consult at a specific time on the specific day. And we go, no, we're fully booked today. What We are extremely busy and you are getting angry because you can't fit in your vaccine but we can't fit in your vaccine because you want to go on holiday and you need it for the kennel or the cattery. 
that is your planning error, not our fault. You should have got this booked in weeks ago. You knew you were going away. Why didn't you get this booked in earlier? But it's our fault. You know, it's always our fault. It's our fault for not having enough consults. It's not, it's not, it's our fault for being too busy. And we're like, it's also because we don't have enough staff because we have a horrible recruitment crisis right now. Um, but yeah, um, and expecting something for nothing as well. People will merrily pay, God, thousands, thousands of pounds for puppies, especially designer breeds. So things like Dachshunds, French Bulldogs, English Bulldogs, uh, Chihuahuas, I would say as well, you know, fancy colored things, Cockapoos, Cavapoos, Cavachons, Mongrels, I'll point out, Mongrels. I had a That's cockapoo. not a breed. Oh, he's a pedigree cockapoo. I had a cockapoo. I've only ever ha- owned one dog. It was a cockapoo, but there's other stuff behind that. So I will not Congrats, tell you. Con- congrats <laughs> on your mongrel. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I literally, oh, no. I literally did make the comment the first time I saw it. I was going, well, it, it, we used to call them mongrels. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're nuts. They are absolutely nuts. And you are being fobbed off on, being, on buying these very expensive designer dogs. Mm. They are arguably that there are some health benefits to crossing breeds because that you know you're expanding gene pools and things like that. But you can't have a pedigree cock. But anyway, I'm going off topic. But yeah, <laughs> people will people will spend thousands and thousands of pounds on these puppies, and then they'll come to the vets and they will really get very irate at the cost of our services, which are frankly compared to what human medicine costs, bargains. Our medical treatments are so cheap because we have to be competitive with other clinics. If we charged what human medics charged for um, for medical treatment, my God, we would be more expensive. We would be so much more expensive by about 400%. To give you some idea, you may not know, and the people listening may not know. Uh, the average cost in the NHS prescriptions in the UK, we pay ooh, like eight pounds something for a prescription typically. 9.50, yeah. You know that it, that costs the NHS around fifty-five pounds to fulfil, and if you take an ambulance trip to hospital before you even enter the hospital, an ambulance trip will, on average, cost anywhere between seven hundred and fifty to one thousand pounds. Of course, you don't pay that because we are very spoiled and very lucky with the NHS. But because people don't know what medicine costs, you know, people don't know that an operation can be thousands and thousands of pounds or something really basic. So, like for example. I had private healthcare when I was a, a kid with my parents and I had an adult tonsillectomy as their kid. It was ongoing, you know. I don't have it anymore because they finished it once I finished uni. Um, but I had private healthcare and I had my tonsils out. Adult tonsillectomy, the op takes about 30 minutes and I was in and out in a day. That cost two and a half grand. It's wild. And that's that's a, this is a really basic op. If that were a, a dog, maybe, maybe a grand and a half, if that. You know, it's a really basic procedure. They do it all the time, considering we charge maybe 300 pounds for a bitch spay, which is major abdominal surgery, really. And yeah, but people don't realize the cost of stuff. They hear our prices and they just assume that we're ripping them off or something like that, or that we're charging way too much for meds. I'm like, no, we can't order in bulk, (laughs) which is what the online pharmacies can do. They can order everything in bulk and then sell it straight to you. We can't do that. We have to essentially buy it from these online pharmacies and then sell it individually. We have to temperature control everything and make sure it's stored. We have to check everything weekly to make sure there's an audit for everything. We then have to dispense that medication, which comes at a fee as well. And there's also, you know, there's the cost of the prescription itself. You know, it's it's not a free service and we're not trying to rip people off by charging them more. But people will not listen to reason when we try and explain this to them. Because people are like, oh, you know, you can get a written prescription, but it costs £25 to get a prescription. They're robbing bastards. I'm like, no. You're paying for that vet's time to yeah. prescribe you the correct drug and then write up this prescription. It can take half an hour sometimes to do one written prescription. We hate doing them, but we will still offer them because we know it gives people a cheaper deal. I always used to offer written scripts for long-term med users when I was doing days, especially for things like uh, Apoquel or, um, I don't know, like long-term Metacam or something like that. Commonly used drugs that are used for life. I'll say to them, you should consider a written prescription because you can get it cheaper long term. But if it's something short term, like, I don't know, a, two weeks worth of antibiotics, by the time you've got the prescription, got it authorized, sent it off to these online pharmacies, got it approved and then been sent it. A, you've now gone about four or five days without giving the dog the medication that it needs. But also with the cost, of, excuse me, cost of the written script and then the postage fees and then the fee of it online probably costs more. Or you've maybe saved, I don't know, two quid. Yeah. You think? 
you, you need to stop complaining about these kind of things because we're not doing it deliberately. And the pure and simple fact remains that vets don't work to commission. And there are very few vets who work frontline, so face to face with clients who work on commission or who, who, who are in management. Management are the ones who care about profits because they have to, someone has to, to make sure that the businesses actually continue running and can be profitable. Otherwise, it's not a business, it becomes a charity. Mm. Um, but they, yeah, they, we don't get burn on commission. If I treated no animals in a night or I treated 50 animals in a night, I would be paid exactly the damn same. There was recently a very scathing, very, very damning and very poorly written article in the Daily Mail, which I'm going to hopefully deconstruct fully in a, a YouTube. Just mm -hmm. just to give anybody that's not in the UK an idea of the Daily Dip Mail, the Daily Mail is now so unreliable, Wikipedia no longer allows it to be a source. I didn't know that. Actually. That's incredible. Fucking Wikipedia. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's impressive. I like that. It's a good fact. <laughs> but yeah, there was a very damning article in the Daily Mail basically just essentially for want of a better word slagging off vets for the whole mm. thing um and i will i am very excited when i start my youtube channel soon hopes hopefully in january i'm going to be deconstructing this entire chat this entire thing like piece by piece i'm going to rip it to shreds in a very professional manner obviously but i'm going to still rip it a new one um but it it, it sort of you know it talked about you know medical negligence and it's like no there was a post-operative complication that you would have signed the consent for to say these can sometimes occur you can get complications following medical procedures you are aware of that fact when you sign the consent form and it was explained to you things like that you know clients be like oh they hurt my dog they help kill my dog and i'm like it's a medical procedure sometimes there are complications i'm afraid that just happens it's no one's fault it's nobody's fault mm. it's just one of those things it happens in human medicine it's not negligence it just happens yeah, unfortunately, and the, I suppose the, adva the advantage and the thing they're not thinking about is that it may not it, it may occur potentially. I don't know the stats, obviously, more in veterinary stuff, but it's not so much that the, the, the stuff is happening more. It's that in humans, the human can immediately say something doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. A dog, a cat, a rabbit doesn't. So it, it will keep going. So there's no kind of yeah. hey, we just mm -hmm. give you this antibiotic that will sort it out. It's it'll just mm. progress and so then people you know end up talking bullshit like the daily mail are, are kind of used to the, the the whole money thing is is really strange to me anyway i always find the way that people spend money fucking weird anyway because it's it's so they'll be the like priorities are strange sometimes yeah yeah exactly they'll be like hey well you haven't you know i should get all my stuff for my animal for free but go and buy evian water which i know is, is hyperbolic to some people but everyone's a fucking two pound for for a small bottle like this thing that I've been drinking off, like that's still water. Okay. It's still spring water because we're in England. So it's spring water, not just mineral water. It is 26p for two liters of it from fucking Aldi. It's mm -hmm. water. It's fucking water. Also, tap. It should be if you actually give a shit about your animal on the fucking animal. It's like you get the same thing with things like um, you hear on, on Ryanair, for instance, when people go on holiday and they'll be like, Oh, Ryanair try and screw you all the time. Um, they, they try and charge me thirty pound for my for my extra bag. You're like, you spent two pound fifty on your fucking um, flight, Karen. Shut the fuck up. Mm. If you went with British Airways, it would have been one hundred and thirty. What the fuck are you complaining about? Like, mm -hmm. it, it people seem to just completely flip the way that everything's going to be a bargain. Now, hey, anyone that's seen my other channels, I'm good with a bargain, but realize what you're getting you know realize yeah. that hey i this is going to be really important to me it's my own health it's my animal's health it's my loved one's health it's mm -hmm. my teeth my hair like whatever mm. you want to be paying for what you're getting if payment is a factor obviously the nhs we don't really pay for it so it's not a factor so it's not it's not in there mm. but with things like veterinary medicine it is in there so take mm -hmm. stock of it because Blaming Izzy and colleagues isn't yeah. fucking good. Uh, like I say, there's no commission on my end. I don't care what you pay for your animal. I just care that your animal gets the treatment that I recommend. That's mm. that's pretty much what I care about. And it's worth mentioning. I've known vets who are bargain basement. Yeah. I think butchery is probably the right way to describe it. Like anything in this world, you get what you pay for. And the same applies for medics as well. It's like you don't it's like people who fly to Turkey to go and get a boob job or a nose job or something like that or to go and get veneers done 
Mm. They get them done cheap, but they get them done terribly. Mm. And you're like, well, that is now going to damage you for life and going to cost way more to fix. If you'd have just initially plumped up a, the more, more money to get this procedure done properly in a proper licensed clinic in the UK or something like that, you wouldn't have these issues, you know? But yeah. it's people want something for nothing. And there's a there's thing, things cost what they cost for a reason, my guy. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've said to people about um, going and getting your, your teeth done in Hungary and stuff like that. But there's mm -hmm. a big difference. If anyone out there, because I, I know some one motherfucker out there that I've said this to is going to say something. Hungary, one, is in the EU, so it's protected. Two, the cost to Hungary seems a lot because that's the difference in economics. It's cheap yeah. to us, not to them. That's the difference. Just before anyone comes and makes a stupid ass comment. No, bad. Um, but... no, naughty. <laughs> but I mean, the other the other thing you were saying as well, and and I think it, it feels like it permeates everything because, you know, getting the Karens, getting, um, you know, uh, people that want bargain basement, all that. Mm. The, the idea of some kind of supervision, somebody uh, on top of you explaining this stuff to them and also supporting you to be able to go, right, if this happens, this is how we deal with this, or or whatever mm -hmm. the situation is, that should be something that's really strong. And you did mention that it's not, and it potentially is. is part of it. So is this something that is a general just kind of issue, like, like having a shit boss, but dialed up? Or is it something that you think is really part of it, it getting into your own head and then, then causing those further issues? I mean, to say that the veterinary world is under-supported is the understatement of the century. It's terrible. It's mm. so bad. I mean, especially towards new graduates. New graduates ideally need their hand holding quite hard for the first year of their life, in the veterinary life anyway. Um, they need the, the baby vets. They don't know what they're doing. They come out of a vet school full of book knowledge, but no real world knowledge <laughs> whatsoever. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how to do these things. And that's normal. That's just expected. Any new trainee in anything is not going to come out being immaculate at it. But they need their hand being held. But the trouble is veterinary has such a problem with staff recruitment, um, with actual sort of managing, you know, any kind of management for it, that there aren't the staff there to hold their hand. And quite often, a lot of new grads get thrown in very much at the deep end. I was one of those ones. I got thrown in horribly in the deep end in my first job. And I don't wish that upon anyone being put in a position where I was doing surgeries that I was not experienced enough to do and having to just manage being given consults that were far too complicated or owners that were known difficult owners, but still giving them to me to deal with and then wondering why it didn't go well. Mm. It's like these things should not be happening. But the trouble is, there is so much else going on in the practice that people don't have the time to hold these new grads' hands. The new grads then get completely burnt out because they're trying to constantly swim against the swim against a, a fucking river of treacle. They're mm. constantly trying to do that. And then they wonder why they get exhausted and why they get burnt out. And then they go, you know what? This profession is not what it cracked up to be. And then they quit. And you go, well, there was a problem at the start there. If we'd have just actually held their hand properly and given them the introduction that they needed, and gave them the tools that they needed to be able to be successful at this job. But we just don't have the staff to do it. We don't have the people there. Like, to give you some idea, in about, well, how many months time now? When do I become? Oh, I think, yeah. 10 months time. 10 or nine months time. Nine months time. Oh, God, gross. Nine months time, I officially become a senior veterinary surgeon. Ooh. I've only been out for five years. It's not that long. It's not like their hand has to be held for 10 years or something like that. It's only for a year. But we can't even do that. We just don't have enough people. There are practices out there who are running on one or two vets. There's no way they can take on a new grad. Or if they do take on a new grad, there's no way that new grad is going to have their support. They've got to learn somewhere. But not everywhere has these people. And they will sometimes hire new grads and be like, oh, God, thank fantastic. Someone to take all the vaccine load and things like that. And they just end up in a a bit of a vicious cycle of these poor new grads only really seeing really basic things and only doing really basic ops. So sometimes doing just just cat castrates and just vaccine appointments for ages. Or you get the other extreme, which is what I experienced, which is being given way too much way too quickly and being given things that are way beyond their scope experience and just being said, right, single swim. 
and it's like that's not how you should <laughs> <laughs> but it's unfortunately there's just not there's not the, the there's not the the support there's not the staffing numbers out there and while we're on the subject of staffing numbers there's three re- there's three main reasons why there's such a bad recruitment problem firstly burnout people are leaving quicker than they ever have before because they're knackered and tired secondly covid and the puppy boom has meant that we have way more pets now way more pets per person and therefore you need more vets but there are more vets um and the third one being brexit has allowed us to not have the same access to uh you know new grads or trainees from eu anywhere near as easily as before we still get some but getting a visa is obviously a lot harder so that is a whole recruitment area that we don't have much access to anymore which is absolutely tragic because the ones that come over from the eu are very hard working they are super willing to learn and everything like that but not to not, not to do down the British grads, of course, of course they're brilliant as well. But the EU ones can, can be absolutely fantastic vets. And some of the best vets I know speak very little English, <laughs> but they're fantastic vets. There was one vet who did my cat's um, perineal urethostomy, um, Merlin's surgery. What the, f- I'm sorry, she... what the fuck is that? Oh, <laughs> <Just> um... like... <laughs> You might not like you might not like this one, but oh, basically it's a, it's a it's a penis amputation. Uh, it's some cats sometimes get um, uh, ongoing blockages. They get sand or crystal that blocks up their their urethra, and if it keeps happening, which happened for Merlin twice in a fairly severe way, uh, you can remove the penis and make the urethra really really short, so it's almost impossible to block up again. Very complicated fiddly surgery, but it works very well. So he now just has a hole. <laughs> working, than if working through the words now perineal appendectomy it actually does make sense but when you said it i was like hmm? what <laughs> I, I do this I, I, this happens with friends sometimes i'll be talking medical and then they go izzy what you're doing it again what medical explain <laughs> also speaking of someone who used to work for a pharmaceuticals company had have learned a lot of these words i should listen better but you know <laughs> But yeah, sometimes so- I'll be listening to veterinary teaching material and I'll be like, what? What <laughs> did you just say? <laughs> but it, I mean, yeah, definitely what you're saying there about them. Not, I mean, them not speaking much English. Who the fuck cares? The, the cat isn't going to speak. You back. would be horrified <laughs> at the xenophobia that some of these poor new grads and some of these, not even new grads, some of these senior vets who are incredible vets who I would trust with my animals and my, with, with, with their life. They are treated horribly by some clients because of their accents or because they perceive them as being lesser because they're, you know, from the EU because they're not British or they're not white or mm. something like that. There's a, to be fair, there's a hell of a lot of stereotyping. There's a hell of a lot of racism, uh, homophobia, and even just general, you know, bigotry towards vets that don't look, fit, that don't fit your typical mold of what you, what you traditionally expect a vet to look like. Most people, when they like vet, Oh yes, brown haired man, stethoscope, round neck, white coat, probably a dog treat in his pocket. And I'm like, maybe that was a hundred years ago in Harriet's day. Mm. Not anymore. Vets can look like anything. They can have any accent, any gender, any ethnicity. Like the LGBT world in the veterinary world is sorry, skew, it, hugely underrepresented. There are a there's a massive lack of diversity of people of color. As to why, it's not entirely clear. But it, whether it's a case of lack of interest or if it's a case of actual literal discrimination at the point of recruitment. But when I was in vet school, the vast majority of us were white, the vast majority. And it's disappointing to see, to be honest. I'm like, is there no no variation? No? OK, cool. It's the pro- I, think, I suppose it's the problem of as the generations have moved on, it's changed. But the people that are deciding who goes in yeah. haven't. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, yeah, this, it, this is probably that is, is part of an issue as well. I mean, whether I mean, I, I couldn't speak for all all um, admissions sectors for all universities, but it may well have some impact. I'm not sure. Having worked at a university, I will fucking say it. Um, <laughs> so I because I've oh, dealt dear. with the with the with the um, the entrance and, and the thing. And um, when, for instance, you are called Canterbury Christchurch University and you let people onto a law degree um, with an E grade for three of their uh, A level subjects and then have a go at the law department for retention, you're fucking idiots. You shouldn't be in senior management anyway. Um, but that's not that's going to be the thing that continues throughout. And um, that's the problem is it, it's idiots that want money and want seats on. Uh, a, Seats on bums, that's the wrong way around. Bums on seats. Seats on bums! <laughs> One bums on seats. <laughs> they're, on the bum. <laughs> they're, they're the problem. You know, like, They're the problem because they're causing issues later down the line. They don't think about it because that's then outside of their scope. I, I mean, you're saying about xenophobia. 
it, it's it, it would amuse me if it wasn't so tragic when when you come across a lot of this i mean i travel a lot uh, you know i've as we discussed off camera i just came back from mm -hmm. um hungary and sweden and, and austria and all the all around there and i remember being in fuerteventura um off the coast of africa which is a spanish a spanish islands one of the spanish islands and going into a pub where it was full of scottish and english people who were complaining about the fact that no one locally spoke english you're in fucking spain you're in a you're Spanish island. In a, you're literally oh, on the Canary fuck. Island. What do you expect? And that's the problem. And if anyone out there, again, I, 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 I'm on a fucking... Nothing annoys me quite like an expat in a foreign country oh. expect, expecting everything to be done a British way. And it's stupid. It, it, Go to Benidorm if that's what you want, you know? Bre Brexit just, just fucked us on so many levels. Um, it was, oh God, it's it was the, the wrong decision. So and if anyone wants to argue that one, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just just a quick CV. Um, undergraduate in politics, master's in political theory, and I was an elected politician. If you want to come at me, at least go on fucking Google first. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of these things that obviously are, are just going down the line. They're causing more and more issues, you know, no LGBT, no anything else. So it's that's just pressure more and more on mm -hmm. top of you. That's just it's just knocking yeah. it down. There's also a lot to be said for the fact that being female is a huge issue as well, being especially a young perceived female. If you're some grey haired older woman or something like that, people are like, well, at least she has experience. Whereas when you look like me, where I, I know I don't look my age, I look younger than I am. I'm 27, but a lot of people pin me for about 23, 24, 25, mm. which is baby vet material. And they look at me and they go, oh, God, is she going to be experienced enough? Do I trust her with my animal? Combine that with the fact that I have, you know, interestingly dyed hair it used to be red and blonde um it's a bit more i guess a bit more toned down with the black but it used to be red and blonde i have tattoos including a visible one on my forearm which is absolutely not hidden it's nothing offensive it's just fish um but there is a lot of old draconian stereotyping and a lot of old draconian just i guess just just i don't know what the quite the right word for it is but just 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 singling out of people with things like tattoos or think with piercings i mean again my ear is absolutely coated in piercings um they're not dangerous they're not harmful they are completely clean they're completely sterile they are completely normal but people look at the piercings the tattoos the hair color and the gender and they go oh well is she definitely the vet i get pinned for being the nurse so much so much two of the nurses i work with are older than me so they very often get mistaken for being the vet and i'm like try again hi i'm your vet but it used to happen all the time on awesome days you know i'd go out to the especially during covid when we're doing car park consults i would go out to the car park take the full history discuss everything with them and say right i'll just take them and examine them and they would say oh when you see the vet could you tell them and i'm like it's, it's, hello it's just, i'm vet it's just, it's just, it's <laughs> the, the look of horror on their face sometimes you could see their face drop and i'm like it just means that everything I have to do, I have to do so much more convincingly. I have to explain everything with so much more conviction and, and confidence, even if I don't feel it. I have to do everything above and beyond to convince them that I am worth their time. I am worthy vet. I promise just because I'm not middle-aged white man does not mean that I am not worthy vet. Um, and I just feel like it's constantly, it's just extra pressure, extra strain and extra work just to convince people that a surface level appearance doesn't impact your ability to be a vet, which is, is, is to me completely obvious, but to older clientele, not even older clientele, sometimes people who are like 30, you have to constantly sit here and convince them that, yeah, I am fully capable. I just happen to have piercings. It is ridiculous. What difference does it make? It, it definitely, I, I think affects, uh, affects women worse because I mean, I get um, mistaken for, for younger but it's not a problem for me. Like, I will happily pretend I'm I'm in my late 20s. If you want to believe that, I'm not going to send you to Specsavers. You keep fucking believing it. The fact I'm nearly 40, <laughs> I, you know, you know, I'm 38 next month. But, <laughs> but I will keep, I will, I will let you be, have blurry vision. But it, it doesn't ever impact me. And I don't think it ever impacts men, really. Because it's like, oh, you're, you're looking good for your age, things like that. And you do get that for, for women that are 80, like my mother gets it and she's nearly 80, but you know, she gets it. Oh, you look, only look like you're in your sixties. It's not a problem there. But for, for women that are in My there... dad was like a fountain of youth when he was, with, I mean, he's not no longer with us, unfortunately, but when he was alive, he was 71 when he passed. Hmm. He didn't look a day over 50. He looked ridiculously young. And my mom's the same. I think the whole family line is just like fountain of youth material for some reason. 
I, as long as I've got my dimples, I'm good. Um, that's, that's my, my Dimple saving, gang rise up. <laughs> exactly, my saving grace. But I mean, when it's when it's a woman, when a woman's uh, late 20s, 30, 40, it changes because woman turns into girl. And yeah. that's where the language changes. And then suddenly the idea of, well, I don't I don't know. don't know if I want to trust that girl. And it, and it yeah. becomes a very, uh, very derogatory attack beyond anything else. I mean, obviously the tattoos and everything else, you know, people's opinions on, on look are just ridiculous. I, I, and I, I, we talked about it in the in the other in the other podcast. But, you know, when I when I started university, um, I had the fun of turning up because I didn't know, know, know what I was studying. I'd applied to random subjects at different universities. And when I first turned up, I was about 20 stone. I had a long black leather jacket. I had very kind of skinhead hair and I had my nose pierced and my ear pierced twice. And I turned up with my voice going, I'm really sorry, but what am I actually studying? And they looked up and just went, and just this looked at me. What's the disconnect here? What? <laughs> they were very kind of looking at me going, that, that's, that's, no, that's, that doesn't fit what we no, think. And that's we, wrong. You know, that, yeah, exactly. It's like people have that image in their, in their, in their mind. You know, I hear, heard a voice. That's what it's going to look like. Or I hear, right, vet. That's what they're going to look like or, or whatever. And you're kind of fighting against. Uh, it's the against... same with doctors as well. I mean, it's entirely the same issue. Um, mm. You know, you get younger doctors who are, don't, don't fit the typical mold, be they LGBT, be they a person of colour, be they pierced, tattooed, be they young still fully capable, still very capable doctors, but just because they don't fit this particular mold set of what people expect them to look like, they're just like, oh, maybe I don't want to trust them with this surgery, and you think... Yeah. It's... <laughs> am I going to have to prove this? I am, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. It's it's very problematic. I mean, I, I remember, just off the top of my head, we, we keep... We have enough Piers Morgans in jobs, like... Uh, one is enough. One is too <laughs> yeah, many. literally one is party, right? And, and the the guy and, and, and the point of like testing people on what they know. He tried this with the people that were going in um, on the show that I don't. I can't even fucking remember it because I don't like it. It's Love Island. Good morning. Oh, he Love tried, Island. He yeah. was literally having a go at people going onto Love Island, basically calling them idiots, and said, and then asked the question, "What are the first digits of Pythagorean theorem?" Piers, that's not what you meant to fucking say, is it? <laughs> you meant pie. Um, and he got it wrong. Yeah. That guy gets a job because he looks like they expect it to be. Having a yeah. go at other people who are just trying to make a bit of money and have a laugh because he's... Intelligence isn't the be-all and end-all. Yeah. Not everyone needs to be some kind of mega mind. Not, not everyone all. needs to be super but intelligent. The sheer irony of trying to have a go at people for not knowing anything by proving that you don't know what you're talking about, but the mm -hmm. reason you've got the job is because you look... If you, Let's be honest, if you give a blank description, he looks like me. He's tall, brown hair, blue eyes, middle-ish eyes, I guess. Um, <laughs> he looks a lot older than you. What are you on about? He does. <laughs> But age range, he's probably, I think he's actually nearer to me than you are, which is fucking scary. Um, so, oh, no. you know, that, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing. I, I'm very aware that if you do a very a cursory description of white male, it's me every goddamn time. It's also Piers Morgan. And that's why we can get jobs. But that shouldn't mm. be the case. It shouldn't be, oh, what's this? Oh, we put that here. It's like one of those sets you used to have when you were a kid. Right, that's put that hair on there, those eyes. Yep. Yep. That's the one. That shouldn't be how it works. It shouldn't be that you walk into a job looking a certain way and they go, well, you look right. It's like the idea that, you know, you just get someone that looks like me or looks like Piers or looks like whoever, you know, anybody on BBC um, Breakfast, let's be honest, they all look the fucking same. <laughs> just walk into a veterinary surgeon and go, here, yeah, here's yeah. a surgery coat. You're now the vet. And it's like, rather than going, hey, let's go to the person that was a fucking, um, the, the number one veterinary school in the world who mm -hmm. happens to have some tattoos is a short uh, is a short woman like <laughs> so, fuck. yeah there is definitely some people who see me when i'm on at night and they can sort of you can see them look at me and go oh no that's my vet so not all the time mm. and as i've got older and more experienced my confidence comes through a lot more especially when i'm talking to clients it, maybe they initially look at me and be like are we sure but then they talk to me and they can hear the experience in my voice and my tone and how i talk 
I didn't have that in my arsenal when I was two years out or something like that. Or new grads certainly don't have that in their arsenal. So they're constantly fighting up against it. Constantly. Yeah, yeah. It's you you definitely I, when when um someone else um that has been on this podcast did a a, a Twitch quiz. It, it was quite funny when you were the expert for your for your subject, um, and you were the most fucking relaxed because everyone else had a subject and you were there just like, Yeah, it's, it's just this, and just coming out with the terms. It's like well, of course I trust that fucker. Like, listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Do this. She actually did a great job compiling those questions, considering she has no medical knowledge whatsoever. She did a great job. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, but it is one of the, it is one of those things. You, yeah, like you say, you're clearly your expertise are coming are coming through there. I mean, is there one that you believe is at the heart of what is effectively killing off vets? Because like like the like the one reason you think the, I think it's it's probably hard to say one reason but the one the one that you think is is that kind of final straw the one that is the the one that's just going hey there's a ledge you know probably things like the Daily Mail articles you know mm. clients having totally unrealistic unreasonable expectations of their vets and then being angry at them for not fulfilling them to this imaginary standard that absolutely nobody can actually fulfill because the TV portrays them as such. I think that combined with the lack of support from, you know, if, if something like this happens, like a complaint happens or something from a client and their bosses don't support them through said complaint, that can be very traumatic, very traumatic. Mm. Um, even if they've really done nothing wrong, but they still have to go through the complaints procedure because that's what you've got to do. And your boss doesn't support you. That can be extremely traumatizing, especially for a young vet. Combine that as well with the lack of career progression, because it can be very limiting sometimes. You know, not everyone wants to do an internship or a residency because they are incredibly hard work and you get paid like absolute garbage in that time. And that's not sustainable in this kind of economy. And not everyone wants to live hand to mouth for four years while they're doing more training. Hmm. So that can really it can make people feel very pigeonholed, which is nonsense because there's so much you can do with a veterinary job. But you can't always see the wood for the trees when you're stuck in this kind of issue. So that's a very right, strange one. I don't, know, I don't know about anybody else that's watching this, but um. This is this is the most fucking ignorant I'm ever going to sound on this podcast. I really hope. Um, <clears throat> but like, I don't know about anybody else, but I hear vet and I'm just going to go, but they're a vet. I don't even think about any other. It's just they're a vet, so they're a vet. Like I don't think about the other. You can other do stuff an incredible it. amount with a veterinary degree. That's the mm. thing because it's a a major science degree. You can go into kind of whatever you want with it in the scientific field. So. You can train, you can teach in a university, you can teach in secondary school, uh, you can go into research itself, you can do papers, you can work for the government, uh, things like DEFRA, um, you could work on, you know, the boards of things like the RCVS or the BVA, which are organisations that manage and run the veterinary world. Um, you can go into veterinary media, which is kind of what I'm in, not fully, not fully. Um, but, you know, you can go into the world of veterinary media. You can do even things like become a medical illustrator. You know, someone's got to draw those pictures in the textbooks. You can do that sometimes. That can be a thing. You can, it's a very niche job, but it's a job. Um, you can do things like go into food development. You can become a research representative, so a sales rep. Um, there's so much you can do. Mm. But people don't always realize that they just again they hear vet and they think oh god well i've trained to be a vet this whole time i only know being a vet and it's like yeah it might take a little bit of time to rejig yourself and a little bit of extra training to just get yourself up to speed but once you've got a job like that your world is entirely your oyster like incredibly so yeah it's it is uh, i know it's a, it must sound very strange for someone that, that obviously is in it because it's like of course you can do all these things but it's never something i'd even i'd even thought about it's just you know it's like, it's, it's like the old things you learn when you're a kid butcher baker candlestick maker that's what they do yeah they do, you know you don't think about the fact that the baker well actually they can potentially go on to work as a pastry chef they can you know <laughs> yeah exactly the other things around it but you just don't think like that because it's. i it's... would say a lot of vets do definitely fall into the trap of becoming a vet becomes their personality which is very easy to do i mean i'm one to talk my online username is a pun about me being a vet and it is a huge part of my personality and well, i'd say my personality is a huge part of my life and it does influence some part of my personality but it's not my entire life. And I think it took me a little while to actually get my head around that. When I came out of uni, I was like, oh, my God, veterinary is my entire world. What do I do without it? You know, I, I, I had a bit of a crisis when I left uni because I was like, I've trained all this time. 
I worked all this time for it. Now I've got it. Now what? You know, <laughs> just do what I do. Just never leave university. Keep doing degrees. It's um, <laughs> yeah. That's so the that people who go back for research and teaching. <laughs> that's that's why that's when that's when you end up getting told off by colleagues when you're working for a university because you refuse to do your PhD. Hi, Susan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not to name any names, but um, but yeah, you know, it, it is something. It's interesting you saying about um, obviously that being part of who you are because um, I was gonna I was gonna say before we run out of time. I am looking at the clock, but. <laughs> Um, obviously for a lot of people, they don't know you as Dr. Izzy or, you know, unless they've come and seen you at the veterinary surgery, they'll, they'll just know you as, Hey, it's Izzy off of TikTok. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's very me- easy to look at my TikTok and forget I'm a vet because especially my backup thing. channel, exactly. it's, it's, it, I keep my backup channel very much personal, like kind of thing. I, I barely advertise the fact I'm a vet on there. I That's was, for my main channel. Yeah, even on your main channel, I because I came across you because of you know watching other people. You know, I it's mm-hmm. it's a weird um like thing that happens in TikTok. It sees you like someone, and then somebody else. You know, I think I think I went through down call, the chain. Call, yeah. call me Chris to Sammy to you, and it's, it's that kind of thing down. Um, and I had no fucking idea you were a vet. I had no idea you were a vet. I think it was just one random um thing you put out. I just went. Oh wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I think no it does ideas. take some people by 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 surprise, yeah. and they go, "Oh, that explains the username." <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie, the first time I noticed your username was on Twitter about three weeks ago. <laughs> I just hadn't noticed it. I've been I've been following for ages. I just oh, no. noticed. <laughs> I do not look at usernames at all. I'm like. They're funny. Okay. Fair I'll enough. Them. I, just, I didn't even notice. So Fair it's, enough. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, and so did you find that, you know, you say obviously your personality comes across and everything like that with, with the media, but did you go into social media or has social media been something that helped you? Because I, I say this because what the very first TikToker I ever had on here um was called me Chris. And one of the things that she said was although social media wasn't the thing that dragged her out of a dark place it is the thing that has continually bolstered her against going back to that dark place so has that been something you know under the pressure under things like that moving not moving country but you know coming back on land and i'm gonna say this guys i know easy doesn't like it i fucking love the isle of Wight. all right um <laughs> screw the isle of Wight. i'm gonna say it here for the record once again <laughs> Ventnor, I love you. If anyone remembers me, hey. Um, <laughs> smoking, smoking lobster and cows. You're the exception to the Isle of Wight. You're the one good thing there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so has it been something that has, that has helped you, kind of kept you going, especially in times that, you know, in personal life or, or for whatever reason, you've kind of gone, I'll just fuck this, you know? <laughs> so I think I started doing the TikTok thing kind of by accident. I was in a pretty bad mental health space at the end sort of mid to end of 2019 Mm. I only just had been diagnosed with the condition I have which is uh, cyclothymia or bipolar 2 um and I was still getting used to meds still getting used to this diagnosis and I'm like this is great love that for me um and I had a TikTok account because it just followed a few people and people would send me TikToks and I wanted the account to be able to look at them properly yeah and I just started uploading random videos of cats then a few of them started to get a few views and then one of them got a lot of views i carried on making tiktoks then i made one around christmas time about a cat friendly christmas tree which people probably know me about and that exploded with views that we're talking millions and millions of views and i'm like what the he- what 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 the hair hair fuzz going on here <laughs> um but yeah so it was all kind of an accident and i had been making vet videos and things like that probably more heavily in my earlier days because that was my my niche my shtick um Whereas then I realized people are actually here for me, not just the vet stuff. So I ended up making just a lot of content just kind of about me, sometimes about vet stuff, sometimes not. And then I made my backup channel to just essentially shit post on more. <laughs> so I could just post things. I'm like, I don't need to think about this too much. Great. Um, so I did that. And yeah, it does both. I find for social media so there's a hell of a lot of pressure I find with it so I find I'm always kind of looking at numbers and thinking okay I haven't gained as many followers today as I have in previous days or something I need to think about what I need to post to help push this one up a little bit I need to help push this out and things like that you know um what kind of content am I going to do what kind of it's kind of always a little bit of a niggle at the back of my mind 
but the support and the ongoing love I get from people, especially like long term fans who have been following my accounts for numerous years, I'll be like, this is great. You know, I, I bring about to their day something positive. I don't really know why. I can't ever quite put my finger on why, but question nothing. Just just be grateful for it and be grateful that you are able to help these people in some conceivable way. And I, I do find a lot of satisfaction of any of my veterinary videos that do get decent traction. I find a lot of satisfaction knowing that that can probably help someone. So I made a video about like why rabbits are terrible pets and I have a terrible pet series on TikTok. I talked about hamsters, rabbits, ferrets and parrots so far. I'm planning on doing ones on horses and various dog breeds and also tropical fish. Um, I'll get to that eventually. Just I'll do it whenever. Um, but the rabbit one got quite a few views and a lot of people commented being like, OK, maybe I won't get a rabbit now because I know about this. And I'm like, yes, thank God it did what it meant to do. If it meant that even one person doesn't get a terrible, stupid pet because of that video. Peak. Fantastic. That served its purpose. And that does give me a lot of good dopamine, a good serotonin. And being completely frank, social media has given me an extra source of income, which allows yeah. me to do more with my life it's allowed me to uh advertise my etsy shops it's allowed me to be able to go and see people more it's given me the facilities to be able to get a better car things like that you know and we're not talking i'm not a millionaire <laughs> you know no tiktokers are really millionaires unless they can branch out to something else which is kind of why i do want to go into youtube because like the monetary gain from that is bigger i quite a lot bigger but also i wanted to do it for years anyway so yeah it sounds like it sounds like a good time You've got to afford the crossing from the Isle of Wight. <laughs> yeah, something's got to pay for that. Let's be real. <laughs> exactly. I thought, it's quite funny because I'm, I'm going to point this out. I'm going to, I'm going to call YouTube out on this one. Um, so obviously this is for anyone that was listening from the beginning. If there's anyone still here, I mean, fucking well done. But um, GG, my guy. <laughs> this obviously the original podcast uh, went up and it got a few hundred views. But and I'm not, uh, you know, this is my stuff is monetized on here. This is a partnered YouTube channel, but um you know i don't i don't give a fuck but it is interesting that it was limited there was it was not monetized youtube would, would not monetize i did question it and it would not monetize our last video and our last video did nothing but talk about mental health of vets and i find this with youtube is when it comes to mental health when it comes to things like that when we talk about reality a whole lot like of putting your fingers in your ears isn't yeah. it I mean, I, I know we mentioned suicide a couple of times in the last one, things like that. And it just goes, no, because, ad, uh, um, you know. Ad revenue, advertisers. not friendly. Yeah, advertisers wouldn't want to go on there. How the fuck do you know? Have you asked them? Like, just change those goddamn. What about for things like BetterHelp? That's the whole point. You know, oh, surely they would want no, to advertise on something. I know I'm we good. don't like, I know we don't like BetterHelp much, but that's just an example of thinking of. Okay. <laughs> YouTube, you put fucking BetterHelp on this and I will sue you. Um. <laughs> I swear to God, better <laughs> help, fuck off. You're not helpful. If anyone wants any more information on that, Google will help you ma massively. Um, One of my best friends has a really big YouTube channel and he has turned down better help sponsorships so many times and they've offered him stupid money and he keeps being like, no, get away from me. <laughs> Good friend. Um, better help. Maybe don't sell off people's information and uh, make sure that you have actual qualified counselors for which you mm -hmm. advertise do uh, to, to have but you don't actually need if you're on anyway um you know we can get into that because um better help fucking come for me i don't care um Legit. but it, it, it you know it is it is interesting that something like youtube does avoid it and they avoid it on the idea of many american rules really because the rest of the world don't do it so it is it is worrying that that happens um i know we are basically coming to time is there anything that you haven't covered that you would like to go over very quickly um before we finish off i think the only thing is if there are vets watching this like new grads and everything is just making sure that emphasizing the point that you are never on your own i felt on my own a lot of times and i didn't realize that i wasn't um as, a, as an example if you are a vet person of any description and you are struggling or even if you're not and you just want to reach out to another person in the vet world who isn't a total basically um my dms are always open i have a business email um i also have my dms on instagram you're probably more likely to get a response on the business email it just say you're a vet or a vet, uh, vet, vet nurse vet pca whatever if you're in that kind of line of work and you want to talk to a vet who's very candid and will talk to you very honestly about everything and try and be there for you. I'm not saying I'll become your best friend or anything, but I'll try and be there for you. 
my 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 emails and my DMs they're always open. They always try and try and get hold of me because I will try my best to help where I can because I wish someone had done that for me when I was in that you know in that hard period of time. But if you are out there and you are seriously in a bad place and you are considering you know harming yourself, taking your own life, stop. Just stop. Think about the impact of what you're doing, not just to yourself but to everyone else around you. No one wants this for you. Nobody wants you to do this. And you don't want to do this deep down either. You feel like you have no other choice and that's why you're there and you're like, this is the only way to make it all stop. There are ways. Call that life. Call anybody. Now, there are people out there who don't care if it's 3 a.m. If you're in a bad way and you just call them and say, I'm in a bad way. I need to talk to you. Even if it's just a distraction to talk about anything else, you'd be surprised how many friends will talk to you at 3 a.m. If you're in a bad way, I learned this the hard way by talking to people at 3 a.m. I say it the hard way. I learned it in the practical way, you know, been in really bad situations where I've been in a bad place at like 1, 2, 3 a.m. And I've called some friends and been like, I'm sorry, this is out the blue, but I'm having a really, really bad night. Can I talk to you for a bit? And they're like, of course you can, you know, and even if you feel like you don't have any friends like that, if you really genuinely don't have anyone to call Samaritans, Vet Life, they're always there. They won't sit there and be like, don't do this, go make a cup of tea. If you call cams, they will. Cams are awful. Fuck cams, quite frankly. Um, but just say to them, I just want to talk about anything to distract myself, anything at all. You know, and they will helpfully get you past that horrible period of bad. Because choosing to take your own life, you can't take that back. And I don't want to ever see another vet lost to suicide. I know it's an unrealistic expectation because we're unfortunately this is an ongoing crisis, but we lost three in November, in the period of 11 days. It breaks my heart, and I don't want this to continue any longer. It, it, we have to put our foot down at some point and say, this is not okay. People need to start treating us better, and we also need to start treating ourselves better. Like, fundamentally, that as well. Yeah, It's, it's something definitely the government um, needs to take more seriously because they can pretend and sh shake their hands around as much as they want, the same as World Mental Health Day, um, but let's mm. stop talking and actually do something and um, if anyone needs the details yeah. um vet life and stuff will be on the description below um as well as uh izzy's socials um that will be on there and the charity for which i chair will also have details below where you can go on to and find um people that you can reach out to as izzy was just saying there and the mm. one thing i will say with samaritans um i'm sure vet life and other things like that don't just feel you have to ring them if you're in those depths you can chat to them when you're just anytime. Yeah, you know, you can literally ring up the smart and it's gonna go, I'm having a shit week and I feel like some I I'm about to drop. They will still talk to you then. You do not have to be on the cusp for them to pick up the phone and answer you. Mm -hmm. So please reach out to them now. Um, it is really important. And for all of you that are animal owners, stop being cunts to your vets. <laughs> um for want of a better word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to finish off on there because if, if YouTube wasn't going to demonetize me, I've just made them anyway. And I also need to go and do my job. <laughs> exactly. So thank you everyone for joining me. If there is anybody still here, firstly, um, go get yourself a cookie. You deserve it. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Izzy. And we will see you You're again. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Bye.